750 years ago, England and Wales were completely separate. Britain was just an idea, a legend, a dream. But then along came a king of England who wanted to make that dream a reality. Edward I would conquer Wales and smash its native dynasties. And to cement his victory, he built a string of castles, the most majestic castles the world has ever seen. This is a story of those castles, and especially the story of Carnarvon, the biggest and most spectacular of them all, a lasting monument in stone to the scale of Edward I's imperial ambition. By the year 1200, the age of great keeps was over. The dawn of the 13th century witnessed a revolution in castle design. No longer were kings and earls willing to trust to single tall towers. Now they were investing in huge circuits of walls. Such great curtain wall castles were built all over Britain, but the most spectacular were those constructed in North Wales. These buildings rank among the most magnificent in the world. As feats of engineering, they are almost without parallel in the European Middle Ages. Yet for seven and a half centuries, the identity of the genius who designed them remained a mystery. It took a detective mission spanning thousands of miles across Europe to uncover his origins and to unlock the secrets contained in his castles. And at the heart of the mystery is the greatest of them all, Carnarvon. For my money, Carnarvon Castle is the best castle in the UK. It's an enormous fortress palace built beside the sea. It's a huge circuit of stone walls with countless arrow loops. It's got enormous stone towers, and the towers are topped with turrets, and the turrets are topped with intricate stone carvings. It's the perfect place for the kind of splendid ceremony that took place here in 1969. The investiture of Prince Charles as Prince of Wales. Carnarvon's huge size made it an ideal stage for a piece of political theatre which declared that England and Wales were united. But when it was built, it wasn't intended to give off a message of cosy unity. In the 13th century, this place spelt domination and conquest. Astonishingly, Carnarvon and all the other royal castles in North Wales were built because of the iron will of one man. He was the English king, Edward I. It was Edward who conquered Wales by building these spectacular castles. England and Wales have been bound together ever since. What drove the king to this excessive display of power? What levels of resolve did it take to achieve this enormous task? What kind of man was Edward I? Well, in many ways, he was a great king. He was physically very big and very impressive. Contemporaries had nicknamed him Longshanks for that reason. And more importantly, he was a skilled warrior. In fact, he'd been on crusade when he found out that his father had died and he was now king. But there was also a darker side to Edward's character. Contemporaries noted that he could be sly and duplicitous. And his biggest problem was that he couldn't tolerate any attacks at all on his royal dignity. Now, I think this was because, as a teenager, Edward had been forced to stand and watch while his father had been deprived of power by his own nobles. So when Edward was king, he was determined not to make his father's mistakes and not to take any criticism from anybody. Heaven help you if you crossed Edward I. But Edward was crossed, and his antagonizer came from an unexpected quarter. Wales. Mountainous and inhospitable, it had always been a divided land where competing rulers caused little trouble for their more powerful English neighbours. But from the middle of the 13th century, the Welsh united behind one man. His name was Llewellyn Ap Griffith, and even the English were obliged to recognise him as Prince of Wales. 
The prince's success, however, alarmed those English lords who held lands along the Welsh border. It was here that a chain of events began that ultimately led England and Wales to all-out war. The scale and nature of this struggle on the border is best illustrated by Caerphilly Castle. Built by the Earl of Gloucester and completed just as Edward I came to the throne, this mighty fortress was one of the fundamental causes of the conflict that followed. What's more, it shows just how far castle building had come since the 12th century. Now this is the very centre of Caerphilly Castle, and in the 12th century this is where you'd expect to find a great tower or a keep. And if you look around me here you can see there's nothing. In the 13th century the idea of the keep has gone out the window. Keeps are seen as being vulnerable, and they're also very restrictive in terms of design. Whereas here, in the 13th century, we've got a courtyard, and you can see you've got the domestic accommodation spread all the way around. Now, you protect that in the 13th century, not with a keep, but by building a big set of walls around the outside. Now those walls are punctuated, as you can see, not by square 12th century towers, but by round ones. Now some people think that's because they were simply more fashionable. Other people, including I think the people who built them, think it's because they were stronger. Another difference between the 12th and 13th centuries is this, the gatehouse. Now in the 12th century, these tend to be single towers. In the 13th century, they're two round towers pushed together, which gives you a nice big strong gatehouse and lots of room for accommodation on top. The arrival of this monster in what Llewellyn considered to be his own backyard and the failure of the English government to stop it being built left the prince fuming. In his frustration, Llewellyn snubbed Edward by refusing to repay the debts he owed to the king and boycotting Edward's coronation. But the final straw came when Edward decided that it was time for Llewellyn to pay homage. I, Charles, Prince of Wales, do become your liege man of life and limb. And in 1275, Edward organised exactly this kind of large-scale public ceremony. The king dragged his entire court to Chester so that everyone could watch Llewellyn kneel before him. Guess what? Llewellyn didn't show up, and the blow to Edward's dignity was fatal. He was left hugely embarrassed with large amounts of egg on his face. And you can judge just how furious Edward was. He's still fuming a year later when he wrote this letter to the Pope. This is a copy of the letter. It's fairly faint and fairly hard to make out. But there, in order to receive his homage and fealty, we so demeaned our royal dignity, uh, regiam dignitatem, that we travelled all the way to the very confines of his land. So, after Chester, the slide to war was pretty much inevitable, and sure enough, on the 12th of November, 1276, Llewellyn was declared a rebel by Edward at Westminster. Their personal dispute was going to be settled by war. This was not a war of equals. England was vastly more powerful than Wales, and Edward mustered three huge armies. So when the king eventually marched in, many Welshmen simply surrendered. Almost overnight, Llewellyn's power collapsed and he was forced to sue for peace. The terms imposed on Llewellyn were extremely humiliating. Although he was allowed to remain in power and allowed to keep his title Prince of Wales, his power was effectively broken and his title was an empty one. Llewellyn was left with only his ancestral lands in the extreme northwest of Wales. Edward set about hemming the prince in by building four new castles. The most important of these was built at Rithlan. At Rithlan, you can see all those typical 13th century design features that we saw earlier at Caerphilly. It's a courtyard castle, it's got big high walls, round towers, and two enormous gatehouses, one of which is there. But there's one big difference between this castle and the one at Caerphilly. Caerphilly was built by an earl, and this one was built by a king. And because it was built by a king, you've got crown records. And those records can enable us to work out the enormous effort it took to build a castle like this. There is a huge amount of original evidence for Edward's Welsh castles. 
We can find out the names of the builders, the exact costs, the precise dates and so on. But for Rithlan in particular, the rolls reveal one especially amazing detail. If you look down here, you can see the word. Where's it gone? There it is. Fossatores. Diggers or ditchers. And this roll reveals that there were 968 diggers or ditchers at Rithlan in the summer of 1277. And their job, using only picks and shovels, was to straighten the river Cluid. At Rithlan, nature had provided Edward with the perfect site for a castle. There was just one problem. The river Cluid was too windy to allow the king's large cargo ships to reach the castle. The solution was a huge feat of medieval civil engineering. How on earth do you straighten a river in the Middle Ages? We do it the same way as we do it now, by getting people in there, digging the hole. OK, now we use machines, they use men. See, we know, we know that Edward had just under 1,000 men here, 968 right. men. They would have already been experienced ditches and delvers. Not that it's a particularly yeah, skilled job to just dig that, all day. It's the handling of it. OK, you dig it. Yeah. You've got to put it in something and get that and get something to it. take it away. The River Cluid, this is just one little part of it, but it stretches all the way up to the sea there. So yes. How far is that? I guess three miles. Three sea. miles. How long would it take you to do that today if you had to straighten a river like this? I'd hope we'd do it under six months, five months. So five months with mechanical diggers. 700 years ago, Edward's men, working only with shovels, completed the canal in the space of three summers. It's an enormous engineering achievement without any oh, diggers. Oh, yes, yes, unquestionably. Using satellite photography, you can still see the original loops and bends that Edward's diggers straightened seven centuries ago. By such feats of engineering, Edward left the Welsh under no illusion. He was a man who would go to extraordinary lengths to get his own way. Edward didn't stop with building castles. He was also determined to introduce English law and English government into Wales, and it was that more than anything else, that provoked a backlash. No sooner had the new castles been completed than the Welsh rose up and attacked them. When news of the revolt reached Edward in Westminster, he was furious. He swore to put down the malice of the Welsh once and for all. Edward's first Welsh war was intended to punish Llewellyn ap Griffith. But his second Welsh war was intended to destroy the prince and to conquer Wales completely. On this occasion, the king's armies were twice the size they were before. Edward attacked on three fronts, driving Llewellyn deeper into the mountains. As the prince watched this snare draw tighter, he made a desperate bid for freedom. But Llewellyn paid a heavy price for his daring. On the 11th of December, 1282, he was ambushed by a group of English knights. Without even recognising the Welsh leader, they slaughtered him on the spot. When the prince's identity was discovered, his head was cut off and sent north to Edward. The two men, the two old adversaries, came face to face for a final time, although few words were exchanged. Edward, satisfied at last, sent the head down to England, where it adorned a spike outside the tower. With Llewellyn gone, resistance to the English advance crumbled. Edward immediately began to build three astonishing new castles. Harlech, Conway, and the greatest of them all, the mighty fortress palace at Carnarvon. These three new castles were built 20 miles apart along the Welsh coast. But there was much more to Edward's choice of sites than simply keeping the distance between the castles the same. For example, Edward chose to build Conway just a few miles from an earlier castle at Deganwy. To find out why, I visited Deganwy with US Army logistics expert Major Mark Vaughan, who studied Edward's military tactics. 
this is an absolutely stunning location defensively for a castle. If you turn around and look below you in this little bit of a valley here with the natural crenellation, you camp the army right here. Yeah. My God, it's great. But you've got to get your supplies up here. As the crow flies, the water's what? A half mile away. You can bring supplies in, but you're not going to bring them along the road. And you're certainly not going to be able to carry them all the way up this winding two mile long no, it's path. It's difficult enough carrying myself up here. And if you're in the middle of uh, enemy territory with them laying siege to you, you can't get the supplies here. You'll starve. So, solution? Conway Castle. Relocate from this beautiful defensive position to a lower position. Uh -huh. It's built on the shore. You can resupply it any time of day, any time of year. It's not a problem. A look at Conway, look at that, we're floating right up to the castle. In uh, the 13th century, you could get right up to the water gate. Unfortunately, that's been blocked off by the modern bridges. But still, you could get right up to the castle. You can see the town key laid out there. You could bring up a ship of 300 or more tons. That much? Carrying yeah. 300 barrels of wine or 300 quarters or more of grain. You could easily have 30 ships pulled up on the beach here or, or docked at the key. I mean, it's really, really significant quantities of food being brought ashore. It's not just Conway that's so situated on the shore. It's all of the castles. It's at Flint, at Rithland, Carnarvon, at Beaumars, all located. Harlech too. All Harlech located. Well, yeah, because the right, sea used to run up to Harlech. That's right. It used to run up right up to the base. All located on the shore. Easy access. Supply the castle. It won't fall to siege. They've taken the one true means the Welsh had of keeping the English out, which is besieging and destroying the castles, and removed that. Now the English have a permanent foothold here in Wales. But there were also more vindictive reasons for Edward's choice of sites. Conway was deliberately built on the burial grounds of Llewellyn's ancestors. The English king literally erased the memory of the prince's family from the face of the earth. Having chosen his sites, Edward began building. Even by today's standards, the king's castles are massive feats of engineering. I went to Carnarvon to find out how a project on this scale would be carried out. If we were starting with a virgin site today and we were going to recreate this castle, your processes would be very much the same. And there's a real possibility that the stone would come by water. So it'd be landing on the quay over there in exactly the same way as it, as it did when they built the castle. You have a compound where it's stored as it comes off the boat, so you need lifting gear. You've then got another lifting operation, which we call double handling, which is not really welcomed in the building industry. You've got to move it into the site. As far as the outer wall is concerned, we think that it's solid stonework on the outside. So you have two walls of stone. Mm -hmm and then you fill the middle yeah. with rubble. That's quite typical. That's quite yeah. typical. So in order to stop the bit in the middle, which just goes in all squishy and liquidy, mm. from pushing out, these pieces of stone here, which are all keyed together, these have to be massively thick for when they pour all the liquid in so it doesn't push them out ways. Mm. Then you see when you come to a corner, this is where the stonemason used oh, his yeah. skill to link this wall with this wall. Do you see how they link yeah, around they the corner and the one underneath that. comes back this way? So this gives you a bond between the structure and makes it stronger. And what might it cost to build Carnarvon at today's prices? That tower is the size of several four-bedroom houses stacked one on top of the other, <laughs> isn't it? About three million pounds. It's a lot of money. It is a lot of money. But then, it, but then again, I suppose it isn't because it's enormous. I mean, it's enormous, it's yeah. A lot of luxury flats there, if that's what you're That's right. Okay, so three million for that one, you reckon? About, so yeah. So let's, can we do some sort of crude mathematics here? We've got how many more towers? One, two, three, four, five, six. There's one behind there, seven, eight. Of course, the Eagle Tower where we started. So that's nine. Nine, yeah. Nine. Say nine times three million, 27 million, and then knock million. it down to 20 million or something. Well, let's say 25. 25. 25. Okay, yeah. 25 million just to do the towers. To do the towers, yes. So go on then, total figure. Well, ballpark figure for we're today's. We're getting to the sort of 35 plus million pounds, that sort of territory. Right. Um, well, I can tell you how much it cost in the 13th century. A bit less. Fair bit less, but you've had sort of uh, seven and a half centuries of inflation. Hmm. Um, what we're talking about is 27,000. Oh, it's a steal. <laughs> <laughs> a steal at today's prices, but in the 13th century, £27,000 was an enormous sum of money, even for a king. It was equivalent to Edward's ordinary income for a whole year. And this, of course, came on top of paying for the recent war, 
conquering Wales had cost Edward over a hundred grand and forced him to raise taxes and get huge loans from Italian bankers. So the way he poured money into building his new castles indicates that Edward was determined to hang on to Wales at any cost. His building accounts show that between them, Carnarvon, Conway and Harlech cost a total of £50,000. Now this is a medieval silver penny. And better still, it's a silver penny of Edward I. You can see if I hold it the right way, that it's got Edward I's face on it. Now, in the 13th century, that's the only denomination you've got. It's the only unit of currency. There's no 10p's, no 50p's, no pounds, just pennies. So when I say a pound, a pound looks like this. 240 silver coins. These are 10p pieces, I've cheated. But you get the idea. That is one pound, so 50,000 pounds would be 50,000 bags of coins like that. And you've got to get all that up to northwest Wales. You need horses, carts, maybe ships even, to get that much money up there. Now, a medieval workman, even a skilled workman, is only going to earn three or four pence a day building one of those castles. So that gives you some idea of how much money 50,000 pounds really is. It wasn't just mountains of silver that Edward had to transport. There was also the small matter of shifting enormous amounts of stone. At Salisbury Cathedral, also built in the 13th century, there is a working stonemason's yard, where I went to learn more about the construction of medieval buildings. I want to know how we go from a great big lump of stone like this to the finished stonework that you see on medieval buildings. Well, I guess our medieval predecessors would have had a saw or something like this. Uh huh. And with one man at each end. Yeah. If we start off pushing it towards me. Okay. Now is this? And back to you. Is this? Oh, I've got it. Right. Now has this stone been pre-prepared in any way? Is this the way they would have done it, sort of, 700 years ago, or? Well, the main difference is that they wouldn't have been doing this at the cathedral. They'd have been doing it at the quarry. There would have been no point bringing a huge block like this into the cathedral and then taking the waste off and taking it back to the quarry. This is a fairly hefty stone we've got here. How long is it going to take us at this rate? Are we, are we giving it enough welly? Well, we can go a bit faster, but I think however fast we go, we're going to be here all day. Oh, so, fairly labour intensive then? Certainly was, yeah. There surely must be a quicker way of doing this these days. There certainly is, yeah. All right. So how much does a rock like this point? This one's about two and a half tonnes. That presumably is not possible in the Middle Ages. Oh yes, not only did they have blocks this size, but they could actually get them up into the spire. Six and a half thousand tons up there. It's a lot of work for it someone. It certainly is, yeah. Whether you're building a cathedral or a castle, similar building principles apply. Now, it's not difficult to imagine how you get large blocks of stone hundreds of feet in the air today. You use an electric winch like this one. But how would you have done the same thing in the Middle Ages? Well, the answer is right here behind me. This is the treadmill crane at the top of the tower at Salisbury Cathedral. It's 220 feet up in the air. Now, the principle it works on is quite simple. You have to imagine two, maybe four men in here, and they're acting like giant hamsters causes this rope to go up, so you're able to lift very big blocks up in the air. Now, this particular one is an 18th century replacement of an earlier medieval one, but we know from manuscript illustrations that these kind of things would have been used all over Europe in the Middle Ages, and they would have certainly been used at Edward I castles in northwest Wales. So there you have it, a simple but ingenious solution to a very difficult problem. Twelve eighty three, Wales has been conquered. Its native dynasties and all monuments to their memory have been destroyed. And in their place, a new order is being imposed by the English king Edward I. It is represented above all by three magnificent new castles at Conway, Harlech, 
and Carnarvon. These castles were built at astonishing speed. Thousands of labourers from all over England were conscripted in order to construct them. But who was the organising genius in charge of this enterprise? The creator of this chain of giant castles? For 700 years, his identity remained a mystery. All that was known was his name, Master James of St George. But who was he? Where had he come from? Nobody could say until just 50 years ago, a remarkable historian called Arnold Taylor became Chief Inspector of Welsh Monuments and set out to solve the mystery. Taylor knew the castles inside out and was puzzled by some unique features. At Harleck, for example, he saw archways that were perfectly semicircular and windows that were built to an unusual shape. The holes for the scaffolding spiralled around the towers, a feature seen nowhere else in Britain. And the guard robes, the toilets, on the side of the castles were constructed to a peculiar design. Could these clues help reveal the identity of Master James of St George? So once he'd seen all these things, Taylor, following what was no more than a really strong hunch, set off on a journey. A journey that took him all the way across Europe to the tiny Alpine province of Savoy which is exactly where I'm heading now. Today, Savoy is a region shared between Switzerland, Italy and France. But in Edward I's time, it was an independent state and a crucial gateway through the Alps. It might seem an odd place to go looking for clues about Welsh architecture. But Arnold Taylor had done his homework. He knew, for example, that Edward was related to the Counts of Savoy. He knew that the King had Savoyard friends, and he knew that Edward had stopped in the province on his return from Crusade. Having reached Savoy, Taylor headed for the eastern edge of Lake Geneva and the castle at Chillon. We've come here looking for that very distinctive type of window that Arnold Taylor had seen at Harleck. Taylor said 296 and I've got 297. So hurrah, exactly the same size as the windows at Harleck. It wasn't just the windows at Chillon that got Taylor excited in 1950, he also spotted these holes here. Now, I don't know how clearly you can see them, but there's one, two, three holes there that curve round the tower. Now, they're potlog holes, they indicate where the scaffolding was when the building was put up. In Savoy, it was normal practice to build a tower using continuous spiral scaffolding, which allowed the workmen to move up and down without using ladders. This technique was unheard of in Britain, where horizontal planking was still the norm. Thirty miles into the Swiss Alps at Labatias, Taylor found more architectural similarities. Remember those garderobes, the toilets at Harleck? Exactly the same design. Ten miles further at Sale, there was yet more evidence. There's no castle at Sale as such, but it is a fortified town. Now Taylor, in his writings, describes coming along this valley by train and seeing these walls and getting a very strong sense of deja vu. They look exactly the same as the walls at Conway. This is the Port de Say and you can see it's a fully rounded archway and it can be securely dated this one to 1258 so about 15 20 years before edward started building those castles and again the archway is identical to certain archways at conway and harlech 
So another really interesting parallel, another piece in the jigsaw. But what was all this evidence pointing towards? Arnold Taylor found the answer buried in the archives at Turin, among the financial records of the Counts of Savoy. And there he was, Master James of St George, a brilliant young architect working with his father, building these remarkable Swiss castles. He took his name from the tiny town of saint georges de Esperanche, where Edward had stopped on his return from crusade. Perhaps the king even met Master James when he was there. If not, he'd certainly seen his magnificent castles, and when it was time for Edward to build castles of his own, he knew exactly who to send for. Arnold Taylor's hunch had paid off. He had discovered the true identity and origins of one of the world's greatest architects. After the conquest of Wales, Edward put Master James of St George in charge of his entire castle building operation. The King's Savoyard Mason set to work with astonishing speed. Now this is the interior of Conway Castle. All of this was put up in just four years, less than that, four building seasons. And look at the scale of the place. This end of it is where the royal household went. You would have had kitchens there, unfortunately they're gone, kitchens and stables. And if you swing around the other side, you'll see this very unusual hall where everyone would have died. It's banana shaped, it curves to fit the natural profile of the rock that Conway's built on. But I'm not really interested in any of this here. I'm interested in what's beyond that wall, because what's beyond there is the king's private apartments. And they're the things that don't survive at Carnarvon. Enormous big deep well here, if you're interested. But this is really the unique selling point of Conway Castle. This is the inner ward of the castle. This is where the king and the queen's private apartments once were. It's an enormously elaborate complex of rooms, but just look up there. Not only is it an enormous window, but it's got the remaining parts of some tracery there. And you can just see bits of fine detail to give you some idea of the level of luxury that was once here. And just pause and look up there. Three great big windows looking out over Conway Bay. This is really sort of penthouse accommodation. Of course, it's difficult to appreciate how luxurious these royal chambers were in their heyday now that the castle is ruinous. Likewise, it's difficult to picture just how lavish the accommodation at Carnarvon must have been. But what you can appreciate at Carnarvon is the amazing sophistication of the defences. After all, Master of James of St George's primary concern was to keep Edward and his family protected. Come and take a look at these. This is an enormous bank of crossbow slots. And you can see they go 45 degrees that way, 45 degrees that way, move along a bit, a straight one, a bit further along, 45 degrees that way again, and 45 degrees that way, and then another straight one, and so on along this wall, giving you this incredible concentration of power. So you can pick people off from whichever angle they're coming at you. Angled arrow slits were a clever innovation. But to appreciate the true power of Master James's design, you have to turn to Carnarvon's main gate. Now, the first thing you notice about the gatehouse at Carnarvon are these enormous doors. Originally, there were five sets of doors like that. Now, another thing I want to show you are these holes up in the ceiling. They're murder holes. They're so you can chuck down any kind of nastiness you want on the heads of anyone who's foolish enough to try and get in. But the last thing I want to show you is this groove here. Now that is a portcullis groove. A portcullis is the grill which you can drop down in front of the door to protect it. But here we've got a second portcullis groove behind the door. And if you follow me into the castle, through the gate, there's a third portcullis groove just there. Now at this point we run out of gatehouse. The gatehouse was never fully finished, so we're open to the air as we come through, but here, I detect signs of a fourth portcullis. And if you follow me around this passageway, portcullis groove number five. As if five isn't enough, right here at the bottom is portcullis groove number six. One portcullis is a jolly good idea for keeping people out. And two portcullises is probably very prudent indeed. Well done. But here at Carnarvon, we've got six. 
Now, what's the point in that? Well, yes, they're going to keep people out, but I really think that's overkill. I think what's happening here at Carnarvon is we have a gatehouse designed to overawe and to impress. So what I'm saying, in other words, is a degree of theatricality has crept into the design. Six portcullises aren't the only indication that Carnarvon was special. Edward's other castles have round towers, but Carnarvon's are polygonal. And whereas the king's other castles were once painted white, Carnarvon's walls were left bare, exposing different coloured bands of masonry. So why was Carnarvon so special? Edward, like other men of his time, loved chivalric literature. He was a big fan, for example, of the tales of King Arthur. And without a doubt, he had also heard an ancient Welsh tale called The Dream of Maxon Wledig. This tale recounted how Maxon, a Roman emperor, dreamed of travelling from Rome to Wales. In his dream, he eventually reached Carnarvon, and there he saw a castle of many towers, the fairest mortal ever saw. So Edward, by choosing to build at Carnarvon, was making this legend come true and building his own fairy tale castle, like the one in the dream. But what explains the banded masonry and the polygonal towers? Well, according to the same legends, the Emperor Maxon was the son of the Emperor Constantine, founder of the city of Constantinople. The walls of Constantinople have the same banded masonry and the same polygonal towers. Carnarvon, even though it stands at the opposite end of Europe, is an unmistakable echo of Constantine's imperial city. So what on earth was Edward I thinking, building his own tiny version of Constantinople in northwest Wales of all places? I mean, were there any Welshmen standing around in the 13th century ready to get this joke, to go, ah, oh, I see, Constantinople imperialism, I've got it, I feel totally dominated here. Yeah. No, quite the opposite. This is a joke intended for Edward I and his mates. A decade after the conquest of Wales, and Edward I's steel ring of fortresses was nearing completion. The king could perhaps be forgiven for thinking that his grip on Wales was secure. But he was in for a shock. In 1294, the Welsh rose in rebellion. It was the most serious challenge to Edward yet. All his new castles came under heavy and sustained attack. At Conway and Harlech, the garrisons held out. But at Carnarvon, the half-finished walls were breached. The castle and its attendant town were sacked and burned. Edward's response was colossal. 35,000 men were ordered into Wales. The king himself set out at the head of the Northern Army, determined to relieve Conway and recapture Carnarvon. But then disaster struck. Edward's supply lines, which stretched from Conway all the way back to Chester, were cut by an attack from the Welsh, trapping the king and his large army at Conway Castle. It looked for the first time like the unthinkable might happen. The Welsh might be able to try and force Edward to surrender or dictate terms. Was this going to happen? Well, everything depended on the strength of Conway Castle and the ability of Edward as a general to keep his men alive throughout the gruelling Welsh winter. The winter of 1294 was a particularly harsh one. With an army of 8,000 men holed up in the town of Conway, cut off and surrounded on all sides, the king was facing a potential disaster. Okay, so 8,000 men stuck here for how? Three months? Four months? About three or four months. You've done humanitarian work as a US major, refugee camps. What kind of problem is it? Without using any modern stuff, what's the problem? The biggest problem we have here is keeping the people healthy. 8,000 men in a confined space, even as large as this town looks, you have health problems. You've got to get the waste out and you've got to get food in. Keep them fed and keep them clean. Keep them fed, keep them clean. Disease killed more, uh, more soldiers than combat ever did. The majority of these men would have lived in tents, while the king and the knights of his household stayed in the castle. But as supplies started to dwindle, things became tight for everyone. 
There's a terrific story told about the siege of Conway by an English chronicler called Walter of Giesborough, and he relates how they were down to one barrel of wine, which the soldiers set aside for the king, but then Edward refused to have by himself and shared out amongst all his troops, so it shows what a great guy Edward was. Now, unfortunately, Walter of Giesborough is one of those chroniclers who tends to make things up, but if there's a kernel of truth in the story, it shows that even for the king, things were getting really desperate that winter. These were dark days indeed for Edward I. As he sat in Conway Castle, trying to jolly his knights along, he would have remembered how the armies his father had marched into Wales had starved and frozen to death. Would Edward and his army suffer the same fate? Could they really rely on getting everything they needed by sea? Now, Edward knows he's got to get enough food in to keep those men alive. So he brings in the basics. He brings in grain so the men can make bread. He brings in salt cod, fish. He brings in chickens and he brings in vegetables so they can make a fairly simple pottage. And he's got this coming in with ships from all over his empire. He's got ships coming from Bristol, up from Chester. He's got ships coming over from Ireland, ships coming up from Gascony, all in order to keep those men alive throughout the cruelest of Welsh winters. So the decision to build Conway Castle by the sea is finally paying off. After three months blockaded in a city of tents, Edward's troops should have been suffering. But the Welsh had completely underestimated the English king. He's got so much food that when the time the campaign winds down and the army moves on, he's got piles of grain that have been sitting there and they've gotten wet with the April rains and they started to sprout and they look like little hills. There's fish that's rotting that they're trying to sell off really cheap. This seems to me almost a, an impossible logistical exercise and in fact, they overcompensate. It's an operation overkill, if you like. It is, it is. Uh, now, throughout the entire countryside, he's got, uh, at points, he's got 35,000 men in the field. The logistics for that today would be remarkable. Impressive stuff, Edward. In the spring, Edward and his army rode out, and the Welsh revolt was broken. Their victory, and their survival was due more than anything to the sighting and design of the king's new castles. Nevertheless, the recent rebellion had revealed a weak link in the chain of fortresses. The island of Anglesey. It had been one of the centres of the revolt, but there was no permanent English presence there. So Edward elected to build another great castle on the eastern tip of the island one last gigantic project for his trusted architect, Master James of St. George. Beaumaris was to be Master James's most perfectly conceived castle. Carnarvon, Conway and Harlech were built on platforms of rock, and this restricted their design. But Beaumaris, built on a marsh, could be any shape its designer wanted. So Master James created the ultimate concentric castle. In addition to its two giant gatehouses, Beaumaris boasted an outer wall that ran for a quarter of a mile and was surrounded by a broad, deep moat. At first, construction progressed at lightning speed. During the summer of 1296, almost 3,000 men were working on the site. But by this time, Edward was fighting new wars with Scotland and France, and had far less money to lavish on his Welsh castles. At Beaumaris, Master James was left facing a cash crisis. There's a wonderful original letter in the public record office written by Master James of St George in French to Edward's barons of the Exchequer, the men who controlled Edward's finances in Westminster. And you really sense the desperation, you really sense the money for Beaumaris running out. Right at the end of the letter he has written a PS and he says, and for God's sake, sirs, hurry with this money, because otherwise everything that we've done in Wales up to this point will have been to no avail. To Master James's relief, Edward came through with the money, and by 1305 the King's vision was nearing completion. 
He'd beaten the Scots, he'd conquered the Welsh. For a moment, it seemed, he was a new Arthur, the king of a united Britain. But time had caught up with the king. In the year 1307, at the age of 68, Edward I died. Just 18 months later, Master James of St George, the genius behind the king's castles and one of the greatest of medieval architects, followed his employer to the grave. With no one to take up the baton, the golden age of Edwardian castles was over. The vast river of money that had poured from Edward's treasury to pay for his huge Welsh castles was reduced to a tiny trickle. All those millions and millions of silver pennies suddenly stopped flowing. Just 20 years after Edward's death, building work was abandoned forever. In one sense, these mighty fortresses did their job. The Welsh never drove the English out and their country remained conquered. But Edward's castles never fulfilled the function that the king had envisioned. Their great halls stood empty as future kings and queens stayed away. Very quickly, Edward's empire began to crumble. Within a few generations, his castles were falling into ruin. Edward I's castles in North Wales were very much the product of his imperial dreams and ambitions. He'd wanted to be a new Arthur, ruling over a united island of Britain. But despite spending enormous sums of money on huge armies and spectacular castles, when Edward died, the dream died with him. Never again would a king of England build a castle on the scale of Carnarvon. After Edward I, kings of England preferred to build royal residences where the emphasis was less on fortification and more on comfortable living. An Englishman's castle was becoming his home. <laughs> 